All right, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us to learn about co occurring disorders and youth mental health. My name is Kate Sugg, and I'm a program administrator with the Westchester County Youth Bureau. I would just like to ask that everyone keep their microphones muted until we open up for questions and comments. Also, this webinar is being recorded and we will add the recording to the video library located on our Youth Bureau website at youth.westchestergov.com. And I would now like to turn it over to our presenters for the afternoon, Tori Shaw, who is a licensed clinical social worker and the program coordinator for Children's Mental Health Services with the Westchester County Department of Community Mental Health, and Stephanie Marcasano, the founder and president of the Harris Project. So uh, take it away, Tori. Thank you so much, and thanks for having us. Good morning, almost afternoon to everybody. Um, as Kate said, I'm Tori Shaw. I oversee Children's Mental Health Services uh, here at Westchester County Department of Community Mental Health. Um, I know that uh, you know we all came together today to talk about youth mental health, talk about co-occurring disorders, um, and talk about what we can do to support uh, the young people and the families that we're working with and in our lives um, who may be experiencing a, a challenge or a concern um, related to their mental health and wellness. Um, so I always like to start with uh, just grounding a little bit um, around who we are uh, at Westchester County Department of Community Mental Health. Um, I know that uh, maybe some folks don't know that we exist, that there is a county department uh, that, that works uh, with children and families and adults um, and recipients of services throughout the county. Um, so we are a branch of Westchester County government. Um, and in this department, we have responsibility for coordination of mental health services, but also uh, developmental disability, intellectual disability services, um, and substance use and addiction services. Um, so we plan, we fund, we provide oversight. Um, we are the liaison with state agencies um, that oversee uh, these kinds of services. Um, and in children's mental health, we are one division of the uh, mental health unit here. Um, and so we do some oversight um, of providers, uh, but we also do a lot of coordination, partnership, uh, and collaboration with child serving systems. Um, so that um, means we're doing a lot of cross systems work. Uh, we work closely with schools, BOCES, and committees on special education around youth with complex needs. Um, we provide technical assistance uh, to our nine community networks, which I'll share a little bit more about. Um, we do wraparound meetings. Um, we also oversee the children's single point of access, uh, which I'll share a little about. So um, kind of anything and everything related to kids' mental health in Westchester is sort of under the auspices of our team here. Um, I really, you know, also want to ground our discussion in what we mean when we say mental health and how we talk about mental health and wellness. I think that, you know, the pandemic has um, uh, shown us um, the importance of mental health and wellness, youth, uh, also for adults, um, and that it really is a spectrum. Um, and that our mental health is like our physical health, and it can fluctuate. Um, there are times when we feel our physical health is, is, is good, um, that we feel that we are in generally good health, we're taking good care of our bodies, um, and then there are probably times in our lives where we feel like our physical health hasn't been the best. Uh, maybe we felt like our diet and nutrition wasn't on point, we haven't been exercising well, um, or maybe we are suffering from some kind of acute or chronic um, uh, you know, pain or illness, um, and we're getting treatment for that, right? Um, our mental health and wellness uh, has that same spectrum. You could have um, an issue with your mental health, uh, um, but not have necessarily a diagnosable mental illness or mental health disorder, right? Our mental health uh, can be impacted by our environment um, and by our hormones, by genetics, um, the same way our physical health can. Um, so I always like to just sort of differentiate that a young person um, can be having a mental health challenge um, or some issues with their mental wellness, um, but they may not necessarily have a mental illness or a mental health disorder. Because when we're talking about mental illness, we're talking about something that's diagnosable, that is uh, persistent over a period of time, and that impacts functioning 
across areas of life, right? So all of a sudden you are having difficulty functioning in school, withdrawing from relationships, conflict in the family, right? Across those spheres of our life, all those things are impacted. It's happening over a period of time. That's where we might say, hmm, perhaps this person um, would be, could be diagnosed with a mental health disorder or a mental illness. Um, I think that regardless, when we're looking at, at youth um, and adolescents in particular, we get the question, well, they're an adolescent, so they're hormonal and they're moody. Um, and how do I know if, if that's a problem or not? How do I know if they're having a mental health challenge or if they maybe um, have an emerging mental illness? Um, and I have some things listed here. I won't go, you know, point by point. I think that what we really, you know, want to be looking at um, when we're working with young people is, do we see a big change in behavior, right? Are we seeing, oh, they, you know, they are sleeping late, but are they sleeping late all of a sudden? Um, is that something that's a big change for them? Um, are they withdrawing? Um, are things becoming kind of all or nothing for them? Um, and that's when we want to maybe raise a red flag that, that we should have a discussion with this young person about what's going on, maybe what's driving, what's triggering some of the changes in the behavior. We also want to look at risk factors and protective factors. Um, just like we look at our physical health and some things that might make us more or less susceptible to a physical health challenge, right? Our mental health looks that same way. Um, our risk factors are things that can be internal and inherited, like genetics. Um, it can be things that are external, like seasonal challenges, uh, seasonal changes, um, trauma, um, environmental factors, um, substance misuse, um, high stress, high anxiety, toxic stress, um, and um, exposure to other kinds of stressors, like technology, social media, bullying, social issues, right? Um, and then with those risk factors, we always want to look side by side to, well, what does this young person have that's a protective factor? What are the things that help buffer them so that they can better um, kind of roll with the punches of the challenges of their daily life um, or kind of mitigate some of the risk factors they also hold, right? Are they generally healthy? Do they have spirituality in their life? Do they do things that are fun for them? Do they have passions? Do they have hobbies? Um, are they going to school regularly? Um, do we find they can solve problems? Uh, how good a communicator are they uh, with peers, with adults, right? Um, and how do they feel and talk about themselves? Um, high self-esteem, uh, positive self-concept are all really protective factors uh, when we're looking at the mental health and wellness of young people. Okay. So we say, you know, well, how do I know, right? How do I know if something's going on? What do these signs and symptoms look like? What are the red flags? Um, I think that certainly, um, as I mentioned, anything that's a big change uh, in, in behavior, in attitude, uh, in functioning uh, is always a warning sign. And we want to look at that across um, kind of different areas of life. So is there a big change um, in um, cognitive processing, right? Are there all of a sudden memory issues or um, other kinds of processing concerns? Um, are there behavioral issues? Are young people all of a sudden out late at night, um, you know, leaving the home without permission? Um, they are uh, like not doing well in school all of a sudden or becoming a behavioral issue in school, right? Um, physical for young people uh, and younger children in particular, we can see a lot of somatic, a lot of physical complaints that have to actually do with emotional uh, uh, mental uh, health and well-being. Um, that all of a sudden there's a lot of tummy aches, right? There's a lot of I can't go to school because I have a pain in my chest. I have a pain in my tummy. Um, I can't walk because my legs hurt, right? Um, I think we used to say, like, oh, you're having growing pains, right? Sometimes for kiddos, which maybe they are, um, or maybe there's something about going to school that's making them feel anxious, right? And they're carrying that in their bodies. Um, we carry how we feel in our bodies. Um, and in particularly for little ones who don't have the words to express sort of those emotions, feelings that they're experiencing, um, we might say that they have a lot of physical complaints, right? They're going to the school nurse every day and asking to be picked up from school, right? Um, and you know, emotional, 
Are they irritable? Are they crying all the time? Are they sort of flat in their emotions, right? Kind of, kind of cut off, right? Are they withdrawing socially? We wanna look in all these different sort of segments um, of um, a young person's life and look at what has changed and are there areas of concern around those changes? So let's say that we are working with someone we know a young person um, or a parent comes to us um, who is in fact challenged across you know, a couple of areas of their life and it's all of a sudden um, and we're worried, what can we do? Um, well, we want to look just the same way that we would around some of our, our physical health and other integrated health issues. Um, let's look at our healthy habits. Is the child getting good sleep? Are they eating well? Are they getting time to play outside? Right? Um, have they developed some positive coping skills? Right? Do they know how to, do they like to listen to music? Do they like to draw or write? Um, do they like to meditate, engage in mindfulness? Um, do they want to join a sports team, a yoga session, a theater, right? Dance class, all of those, all of those kinds of pro-social activities are important. Um, and are they maintaining good hygiene, right? Do they have a good routine? Are they able to have their clean clothes every week and shower and brush their teeth and wash their face and feel good about themselves physically? And how can we help them to do those things, right? How can we engage and connect them to mindfulness activities, okay? Um, social activities, community centers, youth groups. I know a lot of folks, you know, after school programs, right? These are the things that can be very helpful for young people who are starting to struggle with some mental health challenges. Um, and I leave mental health treatment for last because that's going to be sort of our segue um, to the next step, um, which is more formal mental health treatment, like individual, family, group therapy, um, medication management. Um, and also family treatment, treatment for, for parents and caregivers um, to help them work on, on how they can best support uh, their young person. So we have a real continuum. I would say that Westchester County is actually very rich in services, um, although we can always use more services. Um, and I think that um, I always like to preface it with, we have a lot, um, and it's really part of our role here at the county to help maximize um, how we're using those resources and coordinate how folks are, are utilizing those resources. And we wanna look at the full spectrum. And you see on this slide, the arrow goes both ways, right? This isn't about you start on one side and then you end on the other side. This is around sort of what's the frequency, the dosage, the amount of each of these things a young person might need at any given time uh, in their life based on, on how they're feeling um, and based on what their family uh, needs. So I like to start with natural and informal supports. Um, that is very, um, I think, important and one of the most uh, integral um, uh, defining differences when we're looking at child and youth mental health in that Children and young people actually have a lot of potential for informal kind of natural supports in the community versus maybe an adult. Um, I think that there are a lot of, you know, we talk about youth groups, talk about camp, we talk about after school activities, right? Extracurriculars. Um, an informal support can be your basketball coach, right? That could be, it could be your karate instructor or whomever, right? These are the folks that young people are connected to. We know that having one um, adult that a young person can count on that's supportive in their life um, has a statistically significant impact on their overall well-being. Um, so we want to make sure we're wrapping these kinds of natural and informal supports around young people, um, especially if they're struggling. Um, if you're saying, well, I don't know how to find these supports, I don't know if, if this young person or this family is connected to, to any of those supports, I really would love for you then to um, become connected to our community networks. Uh, Westchester County has nine community networks uh, across our five cities and four municipalities. Uh, I like to describe them as the take a penny, leave a penny of uh, child uh, and family uh, supports. Um, these are meetings that occur once monthly uh, in each community via Zoom uh, now. Um, and. Uh, they bring together community-based organizations, schools, providers, um, and folks that you know work with, with young people and families uh, once a month to talk about the needs of the specific community 
um, and also um, to help folks uh, to connect um, maybe around a specific family or youth's needs. So the take a penny is to come to network and say, hey, I have this young person, they're this old, these are the things they like, and this is what we're struggling with. Does anyone have any ideas? Um, and the leave a penny is, hey, I have this program for young people. And just in case folks in the community don't know about it, this is what it is. And you can send me referrals at this email address, right? So take a penny, leave a penny. So anyone not connected to the network, I encourage you to do so. And I will make sure you have contact information um, around that um, at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, we then move up, right? If natural, informal, the child needs a little bit more, right? Maybe we look at outpatient therapy options. Right, that might be private, that might be in a clinic, it might be in a school based mental health satellite. Right? Once they've had those services, let's say the child, you know, now the child has a formal mental health diagnosis, they are still struggling, they maybe are in and out of the hospital. Um, let's talk about what else we can put in place. That's when the children's single point of access comes into play. Um, and that is really a one stop shop, a navigation. Consult, consultation, coordination service uh, provided by Westchester County, um, and there's one in every county in New York State, um, to help coordinate the children's system of care uh, for young people with, with serious or complex mental health challenges. Um, so the children's SPOA can be reached, um, I put that number there. Always, there's no wrong call. Consultation, navigation, you want a meeting, you want um, some input on a specific case, you want to know more about services, um, or you want more formal linkage to intensive services in the community, uh, like in-home services, right? Like care management, like a therapist that comes to the home, um, like other kinds of wraparound services, um, that's what we can help connect folks to. Okay. Um, and then along that continuum, we also have access to things like inpatient hospitals and residential treatment. Right, inpatient hospitals maybe is in an emergency situation. Um, residential treatment is something else through the children's single point of access. We can we can discuss and talk about. Um, and then crisis services. Um, when it is ten o'clock at night and a young person seems to be in an imminent uh, psychiatric crisis, um, in our county we have St. Vincent's Crisis Prevention Response Team. I have the number there. Um, they can be called by a family. They can be called by the child. They can be called by a provider or a support person. Uh, they can consult. They can also do an evaluation um, and they can help make a determination if it's a young person that needs to be seen um, at a hospital um, or if there's a possibility to safety plan with that young person. Okay, so we really look at that full continuum. Um, I also want to note that um, come July 2022, um, the National Suicide Hotline uh, will be transitioned. Uh, to 988, and that is nationwide. Okay, so now rather than calling 911 for, in particular, a psychiatric crisis, an issue related to suicidality, right, you dialing that 988 number uh, will bring you to a mental health professional. Um, and that mental health professional, um, while uh, currently when you dial 911 with a psychiatric crisis, you get sent to Onondaga. Um, now, you will be uh, diverted right here in Westchester uh, to an expansion of our St. Vincent's Crisis Prevention Response Team. Um, and that's important because it provides opportunity for a local response, right? That they can say, these are the services in your community. We are, can come out to you. We can deploy other help to you, like a mobile crisis response potentially to you, if needed, from Westchester County. Um, and so that's a direction that the nation, you know, nationwide, everyone has been moving towards and that we're really, um, you know, looking forward to being able to implement. Um, so with that, I always just like to connect folks to the broader team. As you can see, my contact information is there. Um, I lead the team and it gives a little list of some of the other things I, I can do to support. Um, our other team members are also listed. Um, just of note, our children's single point of access, CSPO coordinator is Shayla Aguilar. She would be the one to call for the consultation, the navigation, the coordination, um, and linkage to more intensive services. Um, Danielle Pomeroy is our family support specialist. She sits with us. She works with Family Ties of Westchester, but we're lucky enough to have her um, on our team here at DCMH, and she is a great uh, connection for families 
who um, are maybe unsure about how to access services or if they want to access more services for their young person. Um, and Lindsay Rivera, who should be your contact person um, if you want to become involved uh, or attend the community network meetings um, or be included on the community network uh, weekly listservs. So with that, I'm going to transition uh, to Stephanie at the end. We'll have some time for questions. Okay, so I'm going to motor on through. So um, I know a few of you. I don't know all of you, but I'm Stephanie Marcusano, founder and president of the Harris Project. Um, our focus is the prevention and integrated treatment of co-occurring disorders, which you may not have ever heard of, but hopefully by the time I motor through my portion of the presentation, you'll have everything that you need to know and ways to connect and kind of become part of the work that we're doing. So co-occurring disorders, a diagnosis of one or more mental health challenges and substance misuse. Research suggests that more than 70% of all of those misusing and addicted to substances have co-occurring disorders. More than 10.2 million Americans meet the criteria for a clinical diagnosis of COD, and we are the only nonprofit in the nation that focuses on the prevention and treatment of co-occurring disorders. Our mission and vision are really simple. Our goal is to raise awareness and transform the national perception and management of co-occurring disorders, enhancing treatment options, for bleh, prevention programming, support, and you'll see in a minute why there's a line through research. We advocate for early mental health screenings, diagnosis, and referrals to provide appropriate treatment and support. Um, the fast facts, because I, you know, I'm somebody who in a typical world and presenting in an assembly with a thousand students, I've, you know, pivoted and do a lot of zoom presentations, but I kind of root a lot of our work in facts that are relatable to everybody. So many people know that, you know, about 22% of our youth have um, um, a mental health disorder with severe impact between the ages of 13 and 18. That means that many of our young people are truly walking around not feeling comfortable in their own skin. And when you look at that juxtaposed against the fact that 50% of all lifetime mental health disorders begin by the age of 14 and 75% by the age of 24, for the work that I do, when I think about the ages of 14 to 24, a lot of young people think that experimentation with substances is a rite of passage during those ages, and they don't really understand or know much about the relationship between their mental health and substance misuse. Almost half of our youth age 8 to 15 with a mental health disorder, no services in the previous year. Now, could you imagine finding out that you have a peanut allergy and everybody saying, oh, you know, you don't need to have carry that EpiPen around with you. Just wait until you have that first anaphylactic reaction and then we'll get you the EpiPen or you tear your ACL. Does anybody say, you know, well, you know, you don't really need to get an opinion on that. Why don't you walk around on it? And when you really can't walk, then we'll see if, you know, you need surgery for your ACL. That is what we tend to do around mental health. So we tend to act in crisis and don't really do a lot of work in connecting to resources early. And for the work that I do, that matters because 70% of our youth receiving treatment for a substance use disorder were identified as having a co-occurring mental health disorder. And 43% of our youth receiving mental health services were identified as having a co-occurring substance use disorder. That tells us that by the time our young people go in for treatment, they're already complicated. And the more complicated they are, the more challenging it is to find treatment. Although I will share at the end, the good news is that Westchester County is so ahead of the national curve in the work that we're doing here, which is why Tori and I are presenting why, you know, a nonprofit, which is very small like mine, partners with the Youth Bureau, partners with the county, because the work that we're doing in this space is really innovative and really promising. And so the goal is to really change the, the trajectory and the outcomes. Now, why this matters to me is there's my son, Harris. Um, he died by accidental overdose when he was 19. He had co-occurring disorders. He struggled with an anxiety disorder and he had ADHD and he turned to substances to self-medicate. The first substances he turned to was marijuana. And I know that um, locally, we're very concerned about the implications of marijuana in legalization and commercialization and the impact on our young people. And for Harris, that led to his subsequent use of opioids and his eventual death by overdose. And so I am a former PTA president. I know Beth Sniff is on this, this um, Zoom. I was on the school board in Ardsley. Um, I've lived in Ardsley since before I had children. 
And when Harris died, um, it was very clear to me that from a prevention and treatment perspective, co-occurring disorders was really the missing piece. I think that had we had more in that space, particularly in the prevention and early intervention space, we could have made huge impact. And so as a grassroots sort of collaborator, my goal is for some of you who don't know who I am and don't really know much about the work, that there'll be something that I talk about in the next few minutes that'll resonate with you, something that you'll wanna integrate and infuse in the work that you do. So I wrote this in Harris's story, which I shared, you know, he was diagnosed as a young child with an anxiety disorder and ADHD. Um, not one provider, you can kind of get a vibe of the kind of parent I am. I'm very involved and in really, you know, do my research. I'm an attorney by training. Um, you know, we're an intact family, you know, people look at, you know, dynamics and, and criteria for somebody to die by overdose. This is something that impacts everybody. I mean, I work in every single school district in the county and the, the conversation resonates with each and every one, maybe with slightly different flavors, but all on a single vision. So for me, our young people, the, if nobody ever talks to young people about the relationship between their mental health and substance misuse and addiction, when things go wrong, how do we blame them and how do we blame the family when really knowledge is power? And so the vision is that the more that we can talk about this, the more that we can infuse this conversation, the easier it'll be to change outcomes. Because as I shared, you know, Harris's pathway was what it was, but most significantly, within a year and a half before he died, he was in one short-term mental health inpatient program, two substance use outpatient, four substance use inpatient. Each program said they treated co-occurring disorders. Each program said he had co-occurring disorders. So I didn't understand, and my husband didn't understand, like, how did this go so terribly wrong for us? So how do you get co-occurring disorders? For the vast majority of our young people, they are using substances to self-medicate an emerging or an existing mental health disorder. Things like depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders, PTSD, ADHD. They are not looking to party. They are looking to be able to go to that party feeling comfortable in their own skin. Then you have that majority, the group that have you know, a predisposition to a substance use disorder and a mental health disorder, like which came first, they kind of balance. And, you know, as I said, I, I present to large groups of young people. And at this point, they're often thinking, well, what she's talking about is kind of interesting. I never heard of this co-occurring thing, but I don't have a mental health disorder. I'm good. At least she's not talking to me. So the final category is where it really becomes everybody's challenge. So we always say, you know, the brain isn't fully developed until you're 25. But what does that actually mean? Like we always say mental health matters. Why? Well, this is what you need to know. There are chemicals in your brain. We're not even 100% sure how they all work with each other, but they're growing and evolving as your brain grows and evolves. When you introduce things like vape products, marijuana, alcohol, and prescription medication, you can harm typical brain development and increase the chance of developing certain types of mental health disorders. So I do a ton of work in the sports space, like student athletes, um, athletic departments, club teams, because student athlete can get injured, they can be legally prescribed opioids. Do they know, do their family know that they can become addicted or dependent in five days or less? Do they know that there could be depression that comes along with a break in routine? So the more that we can do to build safety nets of support, similar to what Tori shared, like the, the community that you build around a young person can make a huge impact. And then you've got the genetics, family history, and trauma piece. Um, you know, I'm often saying, you know, a student will ask me, well, you know, there's alcoholism in my family and, and my mom also has depression. Like, how is that not going to be me? So I flip it right back. So your mom may have struggled with depression, but maybe she had no idea how her alcohol use would make that worse. If she didn't have access to the right type of treatment, that is where her life path went. I often say, unless you have an unhealthy relationship and it's not safe, Loving a parent who's struggling is not, you know, it, it's not wrong. It's because they probably have really well-meaning tried to get where they should get and haven't been able to. For you, you can make the decision not to drink because you know this relationship. Or if you have started drinking, knowing that there are resources available so that you can break the cycle. 
other ways that young, you know, teens and young adults cope and manage non suicidal self injury, disordered eating, addictions to gaming. Um, there's a lot of work now in the space of online gambling and the increased risk for young people around that. And so, in our co occurring system of care committee that the county has that I co chair, we actually now have um, one of the gambling organizations as a big participant in the group and the work that we're doing. Quick walk through rehabilitation programs, because I think pretty much everybody knows somebody who has been in a traditional rehabilitation program. Typically, and our experience, and for the most part, this is pretty much how it still exists. Walk through the door, they take away all the substances, even the ones you're prescribed for a mental health disorder. They put you in a group, not a group based on what brought you to use, but a group based on when you walk through the door. Harris would sit in those circles and he would say, you know, they keep saying, remember life before substances. And he would say, I have a great family, love my house, love my car, love my friends, but my brain works a million miles an hour. When I get out of here, how am I going to do things differently if I don't have tools? And so these revolving door of short stints, blaming and shaming and referring to, you know, I always say, if you are somebody who is in recovery, who is using substances, and you want to refer to yourself as an addict, that is your choice. But we're very um, person first in our word choices. And so I ask you to just stop for a second and think, what do you think of when you think of an addict? Do you think of a future astronomer, a lawyer, a loving son, a great friend, or do you think about somebody unshowered in a hoodie underneath the overpass? And so it's our belief that if you call a young person an addict often enough, that is all they think that they're going to be. And I will say that in a system of care that is often not evidence-based, it is much easier to blame and shame than to reflect back on the services that are being delivered. So they would never know what to do next and the recurrence in use was always inevitable. And on the flip side, you may be navigating young people that you know to mental health providers. And unless they're really embedded in the work that we're doing in the county, many mental health providers, once they find out that a young person is substance involved, will say, go take care of the substances and then come to us. Well, that's not really how it works. You've one person, one brain, one set of experiences. Once you parcel them out, if you don't have the skills to cope and manage, that's when the recurrence happens. There are also psychiatrists who won't prescribe when a young person is substance involved. And the work that we're doing in the county is really designed to educate, empower, inform, and guide the professionals to treat both together. Why this matters? Um, it matters because we are literally in a national crisis. The overdose rates from um, May 20 through April 21 were over 100,000 deaths. It's the leading cause of death for those under 50. But for my work, I guide you to that chart because it is the only place that talks about alcohol-related deaths, substance deaths, and completed suicides on the same chart. Um, we tend as a nation to silo the conversations around mental health and addiction when they really shouldn't be. It should be a single conversation about the single space that people find themselves in. I include the statistics in the green box, particularly because there is not a lot that we can do in the space of gun control. It's a lot of, you know, congressional district lobbying, all kinds of things that go wrong. But when you really boil it down and you look at the number of gun related deaths that are completed suicides, and you think about the work that you can do on the front end, prevention and early intervention, that is my happy space because I think that we can turn the tide on all of this. And I include the information about women and breast cancer because I want you to think of what you think of when you think of a woman with breast cancer. You're thinking of recovery warriors. You're thinking about grieving with a family when there's loss. You're thinking about the pink ribbon, food trains, walks and marches. And the goal is to shift our dynamic and our conversation so that when we think of co-occurring disorders, we think of it the same way. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I will share that I thought I was going to open a place called the Harris Project and do evidence-based best practices. Um, I started working with Michael Orth, who was back then the deputy commissioner, is now the commissioner. We worked with other counties. We put together a roundtable. Our goal was to write a white paper. And then I was introduced to the um, international systems change expert, Dr. Ken Minkoff, who said, you can open a place like the Harris Project when you retire, but if you, if you um, want to accept the mission, you can actually transform the system of care for everybody because there is a federal substance abuse mental health services administration guidebook 
that literally is the gold standard of care. It is not used because every state in the United States determines what it does with its mental health and substance use dollars. Some of you in prevention who may be on may be getting money from the Office of Addiction Services and Supports. Some get funding from the Office of Mental Health. Siloed agencies, you're one or the other. We work to bring them together. Um, our Westchester Co-Occurring System of Care Committee, which I co-chair, does a lot of work supporting our providers, our agencies, our organizations, but we also do a lot of work in the advocacy and testifying space to really shift the, the work that's being done statewide. Um, advocacy and action, we empower young people to be voices. I know Susan Weissman in the Youth Bureau, we do work with them and their students to really amplify the conversation about integrated prevention and treatment. Um, I work with Congressman, the majority leader. I was just um, appointed to the New York State Opioid Settlement Board, which is a 19-person board. Um, thanks to the work that we've done in Westchester, the law around the opioid settlements actually includes co-occurring disorders. So we're hoping that with all of this money coming in, that we can really infuse co-occurring disorders in all the work being done. And now probably the reason why most of you are here and, and really the, the happiest space you can be in the prevention space. As a mom, non-professional, and as a lawyer, I knew I needed to demonstrate to school districts before they would let me come in why there would be value in preventing co-occurring disorders. And I found a study from 2007 that shared that the time between the onset of a mental health disorder and a subsequent substance use disorder is a key window of opportunity where co-occurring disorders can be prevented. So if I wasn't causing any harm, and perhaps there was some good, the doors open pretty widely. Um, something that is brand spanking new and really something that I was not even considering happening in reality is this information about state education law and the amendment. I actually literally left a presentation to the um, health educators and physical education collegial learning circle right before this, which was a great place to get their feedback. We were concerned that they'd be like, oh, we don't want to do more work, but it was a home run. So this is what I'm going to share now. Senator Harcum has introduced a bill amending the state education law to include co-occurring disorders as a bridge between the units on mental health and substance misuse and addiction. This will actually concretize the ability for health teachers to have a simple to use curriculum that talks about co-occurring disorders, which really solidifies a lot of the work that we're doing. Um, Shelly Mayer actually was on a nonprofit Westchester town hall with me and it's like, what are you talking about with this, with this amendment? I want to know more. And she said, you know, there was really not much of a state appetite for amending state ed law, but this is going to be a really easy sell. So there's a lot of support around that. So here we are at CODA, Co-Occurring Disorders Awareness. Um, our vision is to increase awareness and understanding of pathways to substance misuse, early intervention opportunities, increase the likelihood that they'll be help seeking, um, creating that generation without stigma, creating a broad reach of youth leaders. And by youth leaders, I don't mean the kid who puts it on their resume and is the president of a club, which is great, but we're talking about the power that every young person that understands this message can be the leader in change in the sphere and world that they're in. Collaborating on staff development and training opportunities are hashtags easy. Coda connects, everyone has the power to connect and support one another. Hashtag be the link, who would I link to if I was concerned about myself or a friend? We have our youth summit. Our latest one is coming up on March 24th. I have the flyers in here, which I'll talk about in a second. We um, partner with the county. April is Co-Occurring Disorders Awareness Month. Um, when you start a nonprofit for a disorder nobody's ever heard of, you pick when you want to celebrate Harris's birthday, April 8th. And I thought, if this hits, I will always have something to do during his birthday month. And it has hit in a really significant way. We deliver celebration boxes. Everybody has the activities. Um, we have homecomings, athletic games. We work with um, many of the providers and community organizations, and we have a logo that is branded to specifically make it easy for people to understand co-occurring disorders, a simple story behind the stars, and a simple description of everything that we do to raise co-occurring disorders awareness. These are the flyers for the Youth Summit. Many of the districts that you have your um, agencies and organizations in 
are already signed up, but we would love to kind of expand the reach. If there are young people that you work with who you think would be a good fit, please don't hesitate to reach out to Tori or me. Um, this is what CODA looks like. So when you talk about prevention being a happy space, this is about as good as it gets. Um, and then when the pandemic happened, we immediately pivoted. We went virtual. Our youth summit was virtual. All of our social emotional learning tools went virtual. Um, and then we're back. So, you know, masked, unmasked, as things are changing, there is a significant and obviously you're well aware really highly publicized need for mental health prevention efforts in our schools. And when you layer in the co-occurring disorders awareness work, you really hit a home run. So I partner with anybody and everybody. Um, we make it really easy to deliver our, our products, our activities, our messaging. And so if you are part of an organization that we're not working with yet, would love to make that happen. Our SEL tools, like what's important to me, physical, I'm getting up. I get up during every presentation. I don't know why. I just don't keep this next to me. But um, things like our SEL tools, what's important to me, we've done this from third grade all the way through to police departments, athletic directors. I've created national curriculum for the Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association. What's important to us, which is the poster hanging behind me during the pandemic, all the boxes are populatable. And so we were doing them virtually, but now posters are available. Feel free to reach out. We um, have grounding exercises, social media tiles, our new poster campaign. You are welcome again to reach out, Tori and I have them. Um, we now have an official co-occurring disorders awareness campaign. And so we had like 40 to choose from. We did a con, everybody voted and I was supposed to pick 10. Of course I picked 17. And so um, you can have a set, you can frame them, you can display them. It really creates a very comprehensive campaign that includes positive, but you know, not every one of our little um, tiles is, it's like, you know, it's designed to recognize that it's not always like roses and unicorns, but that when you're struggling, help is available and you're not alone. These are our social media tiles, just an example of some of them. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm one of those people where this is not designed so that this is the order you do this. This is the package you're getting. We deliver everything for free, which is why we're grateful that Youth Bureau supports our work, the county supports our work, we get donations from foundations and nonprofits and everybody kind of buys in. We don't get state money because we're not in either silo. We're hoping to get there, but you can have this stuff and use it in the way that works for your organization. Very quickly, I have no idea what time is, so I'm going to just motor really just quickly into treatment. So when I present, and I've presented for years, and I talk about co-occurring disorders and a young person or a family member or a parent or a guardian or organization head says, well, I know somebody with co-occurring disorders or that person is me. Where do I go for help? As the chair of the co-occurring system of care committee, I would help piece together treatment opportunities. Nobody really doing home run work, even though everybody is working towards integration. Nobody was there yet. Right before the pandemic, I heard a presentation by Dr. Paula Riggs, who developed a program called Encompass, evidence-based once a week therapy for teens and transitional age youth with co-occurring disorders. I had no idea how I was gonna fund it, no idea what was gonna happen, but um, Michael Orth and I met with Paula by phone. Remember before, before the pandemic, when you talk to people on the phone, and I said, if I ever get funding, we're bringing you in. I got funded by WMC Health during the pandemic, and we did a pilot of Encompass. These are our, our eight, and now we're, we just got funding from Westchester Community Foundation. Now we have a cohort of more than 50 clinicians in the county who are either fully certified already or are training and, and working to certification in Encompass. It, um, we have providers that accept young people with no insurance, underinsured, Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, and private pay. We have clinicians that are um, bilingual, that work with LGBTQIA plus young people that are trauma trained. And so we have created an opportunity in a space where this kind of treatment is available. Um, personally, for my family, when I look at this, I look at this through the lens of what would have worked for me, for our family, for Harris. Harris came out of the first rehabilitation program 
right before graduation, his senior year of high school. I was a stay at home mom. I was taking him to the intensive outpatient program, the 12 step meeting, the psychologist, the psychiatrist in the gym. He had a recurrence in use in under two weeks. We have young people who are doing once a week therapy in Encompass who are far more successful. And that is because there are ongoing assessments. When substance use goes down and mental health begins to spike, that's when young people start using substances again because it's the only thing they know. This is designed to capture that. This is designed to work with a young person on the individual things that are triggers for their use, the individual mental health disorders that are driving what's going on for them. It's rooted in um, abstinence, but it is not an abstinence-based program. It is a harm reduction program. There are pro-social activities that they have to come up with each week, not just going to a 12-step meeting, and that it's really designed to increase skills, hobbies, likes, and interests. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning more, you who if, if you're working with young people, if you have a social worker already on your staff, it would be great to have them trained in Aspire. You may have heard of ESPER, Screening Brief Intervention Referral for Treatment. Under 10% of those young people and their families connect to resources. Screening Brief re Referral, Screening Brief Intervention Referral for Evaluation, more than 85%. The simple tweak from referring for treatment and referring for evaluation. You know, Johnny, you're sharing with me um, that you've been feeling depressed and you're also telling me how you've been drinking, you know, at every party you go to and that, you know, you're not thinking that's such a good thing. Do you know we have a program for, for that exact thing in the county? Would you like to learn more about it? So you're not saying, Johnny, there's something wrong with you. You're saying, Johnny, you know, this is something that really exists and we want to help connect you and we want you to learn about it. Our opportunity youth park courts are using Encompass, even though the talk screens are unsupervised because it's not for punitive, it's designed to really guide your programming. And so it's a very different view, but it is now an evidence-based practice. So that's us, that's me. This is my contact information. I'm going to stop sharing so that people can ask questions, talk. I don't, I'm not even sure who's in the room anymore. So hi, everybody. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Tori, um, for sharing this really important information with us. Um, as Stephanie just said, I just want to invite everyone to please feel free to unmute and ask questions, offer comments, um, or you can also utilize the chat as I am monitoring that. I'm going to put my contact stuff right in. And please don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, the group can um, have the, a copy of the slides as well with our contact info on it. So yes. feel free to distribute that. And I'm also going to make a, um, a Google Drive that will include like the, the flyers, the, um, the social media tiles, the posters, all of that stuff. But if you want hard copies of anything or any of like our swaggy stuff, like, you know, we have our information cards that a lot of agencies and organizations and police departments even have around. And so, you know, you're welcome to let me know and we can share whatever you need. Because I'm not really sure, I'm trying to read the um, the chat to see who's in the room with us. There's a question, um, is this program only for Westchester County? Grace, um, I just have to ask, are you referring to the SPIRE program? Are you referring to the Harris Project in general? I mean, I can, well, so in, so, okay, so the Harris project in general, so, um, we are trying to grow it. Um, no worries about your mic. I'm, that's the, that, especially in teams or whatever we're in here. So, um, we are trying to expand. Um, the vision was that I could have gone sort of an, an inch deep and a mile wide or a mile deep. And so the vision really was to embed and create the kind of programming that really resonated and then get bigger and broader. We do a lot of work across the mid Hudson. Um, as I said, we deliver all of our products and things for free. So any connection that you have where you want it to go, happy to go on the 15th, I'll be in the capital region. I'm doing a youth summit for them and bringing all of the materials up for them. Um, Families Together, the New York State Coalition for Children's Behavioral Health, like they're all now when they testify, they're including the need for CODA across the state. So we're really hoping to be able to kind of nail some of that down. 
Oh, and, and Grace, just so you know, I'm actually, it's like there's a lot of things in my brain, but I'm actually working with the New York City Police Foundation in their options program. They've created a, a health curriculum and CODA is now included in their, their mental health work. I partnered up with Montefiore for that. Excellent. So I, I unmuted, can I speak? Hi, hi, Kate. It's hi, Ellen, Kate. Ellen Kate. Kate from Groundwork Hudson Valley. Um, I wanted to thank you for this presentation. Uh, we work, we have a green team. Uh, we work with youth and 30 youth and are uh, joining us in next summer. So we're expanding our program and this is so empowering um, for, for, for what we can um, impart to the youth. Stephanie, thank you so much for your work and your dedication to kind of breaking the silos um, because the empowerment through education for them to have an awareness from their own experiences, both socially and internally is, is just critical. So I just wanted to thank you and we'll be following up to ask you to send some of that um, free material our way for the youth. Oh, fabulous. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ellen. We have a comment in the chat. Um, from Candida uh, with Groundwork Hudson Valley um, regarding mental health and climate change impacts um, as Groundwork does a lot of work focusing on um, conservation and the environment. Um, Candida says, we have seen an increase in natural disasters, extreme heat and flooding, especially in the Westchester area. I know we all saw it in the fall, poor New Rochelle. Um, was really hit. So Candida says, with the increase of climate change related disasters, there's also an increase in anxiety and trauma related responses, which potentially exacerbates other mental health conditions and increases substance use and misuse. Also, there's a lot of anxiety and stress when talking and learning about climate change. Um, for example, you know, doomsday type language. How can we help and support young people going through potential negative psychological effects due to climate change? Um, Tori, is that something that you've seen that's been coming up in your work? And Stephanie, too, please feel free. That's really interesting. Um, I think that I would say not specific to climate change kind of as, as a, the, the triggering sort of discussion, um, but more generally speaking, anxiety levels are very high. Um, and it's because of a long list of existential dread um, that I think is, you know, impacting our young people and, and adults alike between the pandemic and climate change and social unrest and um, all those things sort of together. Um, and I think that, you know, what we really look at uh, more broadly in that sort of anxiety space is helping young people kind of in two areas. One is around coping skills, right? Like having pro-social skills, having supportive things they can do to help with their anxiety, uh, identification of what triggers their anxiety, things as simple as like the four square breathing that, uh, you know, Stephanie has or identifying with, with young people, what are things, what's kind of your safety plan? Like what are the things that you have as a part of your everyday life uh, that you build in as your self-care plan that make you feel good and help relieve stress, right? That's always, I think, um, an important piece of, of the conversation with young people. Um, and I think that other piece too is that how we talk about things, right? So the kids pick up sort of on our orientation language around things. And so really focusing on, you know, anxiety is about not having control. So what are the things that we do have control over, right? What are the things that we can do? How can we help young people to feel empowered, right? And it sounds like some of the work you're doing is around empowering young people around change, right? So what are some of the things that we can do that are in our control, um, that can help kind of manage and mitigate some of the things that are that are feeling triggering for us. Stephanie, and you want to add? Can, no, and I'm going to stick in that you know it's there are a lot of things that are triggers at the moment, and I and I'm going to just shift ever so slightly because the impact of COVID-19 in particular um, between loss, economic, personal, people um, changes. There's been this big push that like, once the kids go back to school, everything's going to be fine. And I'm going to say that for a large chunk, being back in the normal world is good. But there are a lot of young people who are reporting that getting off the merry-go-round 
was really a good thing for them. And they're having a very hard time transitioning back. And so I think it's being mindful and giving space for them to share their experiences. It could be what comes out as climate related. It could be it's health and wellness. It could be mental health disorders because of their brain. And that's why as simple as a tool like what's important to me is, the prompts literally are, what are the things that are important to you at the moment? When you have a good day, what are the things that make it good? Are there particular struggles, challenges, and problems that you're facing? What are your strengths? How do you use your strengths to face challenges? I would say that any organization that works with young people should have these kind of check-in opportunities to really learn a bit more. But there's often, and I've learned there's a fear. If I do a tool like this, what am I going to do when I find something out? And that's why creating these opportunities to connect with me, who could then connect you to the agencies that are doing the co-occurring work, connecting with Tori and knowing what level of service entry you need, that gives you comfort that we're going to find out because we know what to do about it. And that also gives the young people confidence that the adults that they're working with are not just lending an ear, but are really capable of saying, I don't really have the skill set for this, but I know the people who do. And that's where I think we create this full circle ability to support our young people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also in that the way that we can build those things in, right? Um, right. Yeah. War, right. Another one, uh, right. All this existential sort of um, uh, triggering uh, things happening in the world, I think, you know, for sure um, are impacting uh, uh, young people and also their responding to how their parents and families are responding as well, right? So that's a piece of it too. Um, so I think that ha as being adults in kids' lives who can model good self-regulation, good self-care um, is really key. Um, and building it in, in a way that's not about, oh, you know, Stephanie is having anxiety, is triggered. So I'm going to refer Stephanie out because we can't always, we want to find ways that are not ultimately uh, rejecting for young people, right? That are more accepting of you're having, you're experiencing a feeling and a feeling that a lot of other young people are probably feeling. So how can we account for that? Maybe we start, you know, we start our meetings with something grounding. We end with something grounding with an activity, with a mindfulness exercise, right? As just a part of what we do together. Um, and that can be, you know, very helpful. Those were excellent suggestions. Um, you know, really great tangible ideas that some of our program staff can utilize in their programs. Um, and I think Stephanie said, you know, when you spoke about the connections, these connections from the youth development field um, and the prevention work to intervention um, are so important. Um, so again, I, I see the time and I, I want to be mindful of everyone's schedules today. Um, so we're going to wrap up and I just want to thank you again, Tori and Stephanie for your time for all of this really valuable information that you shared and to all of our participants for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll be sending out the slides. So all of the contact information will be there. Um, and again, a recording of the webinar will be on our Youth Bureau website. Um, if anyone joined us today has colleagues and you would like for them to watch, um, please direct them to our website at youth.westchestergov.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.